So we've got a frost advisory and more importantly a freeze warning for my area and that begins this coming midnight and goes until tomorrow morning and possibly the next evening as well. So should I be concerned seeing as I've got all these blossoms on my fruit trees? So the variety of fruit trees that you choose to grow really do come into play in these type of situations. Fruit trees like peaches, uh, plums, uh, apriums, stone fruits are some of the first to start to begin their bloom cycle. And right here in Northern California where I'm at zone 9B, it's pretty often that we kind of warm up sometime in early February and then we get hit with some cold snaps. It happens quite frequently. So. We're going to have to do something about this to try to save our crop. Now some trees like this white nectarine here are still in the early stage of waking up and this right here is what we call swollen buds. So at this point these are actually pretty well protected. They're a little bit vulnerable but definitely not as bad as when the flowers are opened up. And here's an example where there's no concern at all. This is an apple tree still completely dormant so there's nothing to worry about with this cold snap coming in. I'm definitely going to want to harvest all the rest of these kumquats off the tree. Uh, freeze comes in and it will ruin these fruits. And thank goodness I got my helper out here to help me harvest these kumquats while I make this video. Thank you, honey. You're welcome, Hart. Let me grab one of those. You look like you're having fun. <laughs> it's a lot. Now before I jump into sharing with you the different ways that you can protect your trees that are in bloom and also show you how I'm going to be protecting my trees, I wanted to also give you a little bit of information that might help ease your mind a little bit on why you might not want to overly concern yourself when events like this occur. Now statistically speaking, if we get down to let's say 28 degrees Fahrenheit for a short duration, I could expect to lose somewhere in the range of about 10% of my crop. Um, whereas if we were to actually dip down to let's say 24 degrees Fahrenheit, I might lose 90%, maybe 100% of my crop. So there is a big difference with just a few degrees temperature. You know, that might not be that bad of a thing to lose, let's say 10 upwards to 50% of your crop. I know it sounds bad, but you're usually thinning uh, a good percentage of what's actually growing on the tree in the first place in order to facilitate uh, what crop that you do end up bringing to full maturity so that uh, you don't have too much fruit on one particular tree um, weighing it down and also just overwhelming the tree's ability to ripen fruit. And so that's what I mean by not overly concerning yourself. If you just have one night where it might get just below 32, you know, in between the 28 to 32 degree Fahrenheit range, you're probably going to be okay unless you've got a very young tree with just a few blossoms on it. But if you've got hundreds of blossoms, um, you could probably um, be okay losing about 10% of those. Now, I wouldn't use that as an excuse to not do anything. There's some really simple things that you can do to help protect your trees that I'm gonna go over now. Now, just about everybody's aware of the technique where you can cover your trees with a frost blanket or some greenhouse plastic as a means to protect it during these cold spells. And that's a great way to do it. It's inexpensive, easy to do. Usually involves putting stakes around the tree or building some sort of structure out of maybe something like PVC and then blanketing the tree. You want to make sure that when you do this that the material you're using doesn't touch the tree or its foliage in any area as it will transmit the cold and end up harming the tree. You also want it to uh, be long enough to where you can have an extra foot or so draping onto the ground so that you can put rocks or bricks around the base of the material to keep the cold from coming in through the bottom. There are other techniques that are pretty common as well, such as using those old incandescent Christmas light strings and stringing up all throughout the tree. Those older light bulbs with the filaments will actually create heat. It's not a large amount of heat, um, but it usually will increase the temperature within the immediate area, creating a little microclimate, um, possibly saving the tree. Um, I'm not really interested in doing either one of those methods. What I looked for for inspiration on what it is that I should be doing 
was based upon what do the big boys do? What do the commercial growers do? There's no way they're going around putting plastic or fabric over their trees or um, hanging Christmas lights on their trees. So what is it that they do? And they've got so much on the line. You know, unlike me, this is, uh, yeah, there was an investment of time. And of course, I'm looking forward to getting a harvest. But, you know, these commercial growers, their whole livelihood may depend on the crops. So what is it that they do? So commercial growers will use several different techniques. Um, I'll start at the bottom, probably the least likely to be used and one that's probably not as effective which is actually putting heaters or starting small fires within the orchard. And I don't think that that's that common of a practice, but it is used. Another one that's not as common, but has been growing in popularity is to use large turbo fans. That basically uh, disturbs the area between the freeze zone towards the bottom of the ground and what's known as the inversion zone where that cold air starts to creep up into the canopy of the tree. And these fans are large and expensive, several thousand dollars, and they have the ability to actually create turbulence through acreage just with one fan. So obviously we're not going to be doing that and uh, chances are you're probably not going to be starting fires or putting any sort of heater out in your orchard. So what's another method that they use that I really like that me and you can do? Well, a lot of them use overhead sprinkler systems. And the reason for this is that when you're in that freeze temperature range and you're actually um, consistently dropping precipitation onto the plants, even if it freezes, as long as that water doesn't turn to foggy ice but instead stays clear you're in effect insulating the tree the tree is not becoming damaged and this is called an endothermic reaction now if that ice starts to become cloudy and hazy now it's become exothermic and at that point uh, the tree is losing heat and damage can occur now like in the case of what i'm going to be dealing with over this next evening there's actually a really small window of time where the temperatures are going to get the coldest and that's usually really early in the morning around 5 a.m so there's about a three hour window or so that I wanna make sure that if I'm gonna use this technique, I've got consistent precipitation. And by doing this, uh, I should be able to protect my crops with very little effort and uh, at the same time also watering my plants, which they haven't seen a lot of water in quite some time here in California. So, so to accomplish this, I'm gonna be using these rainforest watering heads. There might be another name for it. That's what I know them as. And these actually put off uh, a really nice precipitation. It almost mimics a rainfall. And these actually use one third the water of a standard sprinkler. So if I were to run it for let's say three hours, it would only be equivalent to an hour with a standard sprinkler. So cost effective, it's good for water conservation. And I actually built this setup here. I was able to get these sprinkler heads in a pack of five. It was a while back, but I believe it was on Amazon. And what it has is these half inch male threads. So I was able to get some half inch PVC and some uh, appropriate connectors and put this together uh, really cheaply. And it's highly effective. As you can see, I can easily move it around wherever I want it. I've got it connected to this three foot T-post and just a little electrical tape. And that's how it stays put. And I've got several of these so I can have these set up in predetermined areas and have them on a timer and either run these in intervals, which is one way to deal with a larger area of space. If you do try to connect these on a manifold system from one water source, uh, the power decreases obviously. So even just two of these running off the same water line, you get 50% of the power. So um, it's not quite as far reaching and it's spread. These will actually go 30 feet in circumference. So they really do shoot a long ways. But like I said, you could put these on timers and have them on an interval. So let's say 15 minutes on, 15 minutes off and going back and forth. That would be another way to accomplish it. So as you can see, this works really well. So 
So this is the first model of this type of sprinkler that I'd purchased. This is called a rainforest sprinkler and it comes on a tripod. I think this was about $35 does a great job. My only issue with it is that I was consistently getting leakage from the connection here. I tried replacing the gasket, tried several things and I couldn't get that to completely stop leaking but not really a big issue. I still do use this and let's say you have just one fruit tree that needs protecting. Many folks might just have one fruit tree in their yard. You could easily just stick a standard sprinkler right at the base of the tree. As long as the water shoots up high enough to coat the entire tree that would be efficient. And of course, if time is of the essence, and you don't have a sprinkler that will reach all of your trees, you can get out there and do this manually. So I'm very confident this is going to work out. This is what the pros do. And although this is my first time trying this technique, wanted to share it with you guys. You might currently find yourself in a very similar situation. This video may be helpful, so that's what my hopes are. So here's something else I just picked up in preparation for this incoming freeze. This is an Accurite backyard weather thermometer. It's wireless. You could place the outdoor sensor on the right up to 165 feet away from wherever you have the display. But I can install this sensor outside and put the display next to the bed and set my alarm, let's say three in the morning, four in the morning, and check on it and see where we're at. Or I could set my sprinklers up on an automatic timer and have them come on at let's say 3 a.m. until maybe 6.30 a.m. But I think uh, for this one, I'm gonna be involved. I don't mind getting up in the middle of the night and making sure everything's going well. Um, you know, not everything comes so easy as we want it to, but hey, like I said, uh, there was time and investment uh, put into these fruit trees. I'm really looking forward to getting a crop, so it's not that big of a deal for me to, you know, wake myself up at a time I usually wouldn't be up and come out just to make sure that, for one, the sprinkler is reaching the entire area. A little breeze, a little wind could actually shift uh, that sprinkler from going in one direction. And I think rather than cover any of these other plants with a row cover or anything like that. I'm just going to use this entire technique to cover the entire landscape. So set up a couple of these sprinklers, put them on intervals, and uh, monitor what's going on. I mean everything that I have out here right now is considered a cold weather crop. Nothing fragile like a summer crop of tomatoes or anything growing yet, so not too much concern. And as always I'll be updating you guys on how everything turns out, so stay tuned for that. Until next time, this is Dan from PlantAbundance.com. Wishing you all a great rest of your day. Take care. I'll be talking to you again soon.